Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for joining us. My name is Jake Hughes, and I am the content producer here at the Walker Arts Center, uh, and I have the distinct pleasure of our, overseeing our publishing projects here at the Walker. Um, and so we're just all very excited that you could join us for tonight's panel on creating photography books. Um, I'd just like to start the evening by acknowledging that the Walker Arts Center is located on the contemporary, traditional, and ancestral homelands of the Dakota people. This site, which was once an expanse of marshland and meadow, holds meeting for Dakota, Ojibwe, and indigenous people from other native nations who still live in the community today. Um, you might not be aware of this, but uh, this program is through a collaboration with our new design shop. If you haven't seen it, Idea House 3. It's over in the Hennepin lobby, which is the other side of the building. Um, if you haven't been, it's a really, uh, wonderful contemporary design store that celebrates iconic design, sustainable practice, uh, and timeless objects. And for those of you who maybe remember previous iterations of that space, we used to have that book wall, which we are very all excited is back. So not only are the works by all of our panelists um, this evening available there, but also all kinds of other photo books, art books, as well as books on culture, fashion, design, scholarship, all that fun, creative, and nerdy things. So we really recommend, um, if you're not able to this evening, to stop on back. It's always free to go into any time that the museum is open. And so I'd like to kind of just dive straight in to the reason we're all here this evening. And I'd like to start by introducing our esteemed panelists. Uh, first off, we have Wordsworth M. Musingusi is an image maker, visual artist, author, archivist, and educator based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Using and mixing both traditional and new approaches to image making, storytelling, curating, and publishing, he aims to reframe the dominant narratives about contemporary American experience and identity through the intergenerational lens of underground nightlife and DIY culture, community organizing, and other subculture and social movements across borders. Um, to Wordsworth's right, we have Shannon Tagar. The photographs have been exhibited internationally and featured in publications such as CNN, The New York Times, T-Style Magazine, Financial Times, Le Monde, and The Paris Review. Her first book, Seance, was named one of Time Magazine's Best Photography Books of 2019. She's currently working on an illustrated book about the Society for Research on Report and Telekinesis, also known as SORAT which is a fun little acronym, uh, one of the strangest cases in the history of parapsychology. Shannon lives in St. Paul, Minnesota. <laughs> and next up, we have Catherine Turchon, is a professor of media arts at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design. She holds an MFA from Yale University and a BFA from the Cooper Union. Turchon's photo photographic work with her 8x10 large format camera which a little shout out to large format cameras. Um, explores family history and monuments in post-communist Ukraine. Her portrait projects from where they came, Promise of Recovery and Brechnev's Daughters investigate the human face of a country that has been undergoing historic political upheaval, most recently in the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014 and in 2022. Turchon has been awarded numerous grants through her career, including a Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, a Fulbright Fellowship, a McKnight Foundation Grant, a Jerome Foundation Grant, and a Bush Foundation Grant. Her work has been exhibited and collected in major museums worldwide, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Chicago Art Institute, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and many others. Turchon's first monograph from when the from where they came, excuse me, was published in spring of 2023 by Stanley Barker, UK. And then our moderator for this evening is Alex Soth, is a photographer born and based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, if you didn't notice a theme <laughs> amongst all of them. Um, he's published over 25 books, including Sleeping by the Mississippi, 2004, Niagara, 2006, Broken Manual, 2010, Songbook, 2015, I Know How Furiously Your Heart is Beating, 2019, and A Pound of Pictures, 2022. 
South has over 50 solo exhibitions, including survey shows organized at the Jeune de Pume in Paris, the Walker Arts Center uh, in Minnesota, the Media Space in London. South is a recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, including yet another Guggenheim Fellowship. And in 20, so excuse me, in 2008, South created Little Brown Mushroom, a multimedia enterprise focused on visual storytelling. South is represented by Sean Kelly, New York, Weinstein Hammonds Gallery in Minneapolis, Frankel Gallery in San Francisco, Locke Gallery in Berlin, and is a member of Magnum Photos. Thank you. And uh, this is my first time moderating, so these guys just found that out, so thank you for experiencing this with me. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that the book wall was mentioned because it that space was so important for me when I was discovering photo books, and I'm so happy to have it back. Um, it was just like two weeks ago that I was there browsing, and someone came up to me, and we started talking about books, and just it was just yesterday he visited uh, my library, and we were having a chat, uh, kind of nerding out on photo books, and we we were talking about this musical analogy to photography books, which happens to be the way I explain it to people outside uh, of the arts, I guess. Um, because photography as a medium, I mean, is gigantic, right? It's this whole world. And when you tell someone you're a photographer, they imagine, uh, you know, maybe a newspaper photographer or a photojournalist or wildlife or whatever, um, but this this world of the photo book is tiny, it's just a little neighborhood. Um, and that wall <laughs> that the walker has was, was the, the neighborhood in Minneapolis um, for that space. Um, my analogy in terms of music for the photo book is that it's like the vinyl album. It's this tactile thing that you can possess and in and like vinyl it's become more popular in the streaming era um and so over the last 20 years or so there's just been more and more events like this where we can talk about photo books and i'm so happy to be with these three bookmakers and uh first i'm going to introduce katherine turchon who has made one of the great albums of the last couple of years. <laughs> Both sides. Both sides. Both sides. Um, I don't know how to do this. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. I've got a juggling act to do. Okay, first picture. Um, I was born in the suburban New Jersey to Ukrainian refugees. New Jersey. Yo. <laughs> I, I grew up in a multi-generational household that smelled of soup and verenike, which are kind of pierogies as we know them, and where I learned the many stories about Ukraine, uh, the country that my family had left behind. My book, From Where They Came, reflects all of this. Juggling it. Like an old family album, the book begins and ends with portraits of my ancestors. On the left is a photograph of my grandfather as a Ukrainian People's Army rifleman in 1918. The photograph is taken shortly before he escaped death. To the right is a picture of a large family of eight children, um, and, in, and he left them behind. He is in, on the upper right-hand corner um, holding a kitten, if you can see him up there. In between these two old photographs are a sequence of my own portraits, interiors and landscapes selected from 1991 to 2008. When this project began in 1991, my grandfather had died and my parents were both diagnosed with early onset dementia, two different <coughs> kinds, but pretty cruel. The photographs, this project, and this book are born out of love and loss. 
During these many trips to Ukraine, year after year, I reconnected to my vast family. I traveled to the western borders, to the central Ukraine, and to Crimea, which is now annexed by the Russians. The I photographed strangers and children and nuns. Um, I tried to gather as many portraits and hope to somehow describe a struggling country evolving into a democracy. And all, all along looking for loss and love that I had lost. My process is slow. That is, I know it took decades to publish one book. What I mean is the act of photographing is slow, too. Uh, there are hours of waiting. With an 8x10 camera, I have to take my time photographing. It, all this humbles me. I love to look carefully and weigh and measure. It soothes me, and I always have been a way of, it's always been a way of coping. This uh, practice of photographing in Ukraine has become a life's work, and uh, Ukraine has become a second home. I was approached by Stanley Barker uh, to print this work after the war started in Ukraine. Uh, so the printing of this book is bittersweet. Bitter because it took a brutal war to uh, resurrect the photographs, and sweet because many <coughs> after so many years I could show the work and reveal a more peaceful time in Ukraine's history. Because this work from Ukraine spans from 2020, uh, up until 2020, because it's up until COVID that I was photographing in Ukraine, I had many questions for my publisher, right? So I have this huge body of work. What do we do with it? Do we print everything? Do we just print the early years, just the portraits, just the children, just the nuns? So working with my publisher, specifically Gregory Barker, allowed me to narrow down um, the work. And uh, I think it's really important about bookmaking is to listen to other people's voices. And I thank him for his expertise and his guidance because I think I would have messed it up if it was all up to me. Um, in the book is a commissioned short story um, entitled In a Cast of Time with a Fracture at Its Bottom. And it, it's by Sofia Andrukhovich, uh, a cr Ukrainian writer from a literary family uh, who lives in Kyiv. And she wrote this commissioned story uh, during the heaviest bombings in Kiev in 2022. And in this story, she writes about photo pictures. Um, and the pictures that she's writing about are the pictures that are printed, painted, or in one's mind, in one mind's eye. Um, and to quote her, she said, reflected pictures, they rescue us. They whisper to us nothing <coughs> that nothing has been forgotten. That which has been lost forever remains nonetheless. Each subsequent change denies neither the previous nor the next one. We remember absolutely everything, even if we don't suspect it. Suspect it. The last piece of writing is my own. Um, although Stanley Barker is known for his books without any writing whatsoever, which is actually kind of amazing, um, we thought the words were important in this project. Um, so in the essay, I write about my grandfather and how we collaborated and drew on a cheap Ukrainian-American newspaper named Swoboda, which I actually kind of remember uh, Richard Nixon um, painting over his face. Um, <laughs> in the essay, I write about a time with my grandfather and how we collaborated, collaboratively drew on cheap Ukrainian-American newspapers named Swoboda, which means freedom. Um, we drew together on these newspapers at times from memory um, and, from, and from those he's left behind and from other times while watching the people in the grocery store parking lot, which um, we sat in the car and we waited for Nana to come back with groceries. He said we were collecting a family of locals. In addition to the many portraits in this book, there are photographs of interiors and landscapes, and I wanted to end with this one. While making this photograph, um, I was inspired by the Polish writer who lived in the 1930s in Druchowicz, which is now Ukraine. Um, and he is writing in 1930, and he's escaped, he's, the Nazis are coming, and he's Jewish. It is strange how interiors reflect their dark, turbulent past, how in their stillness bygone history tries to be reenacted, 
how the same situations repeat themselves with infinite variations turned upside down and inside out from fruitless dialectic of wallpapers and hangings. And that's Bruno Schultz from The, screen, uh, the Street of Crocodiles. And that is my last photograph. Thank you. Thank you. You good to go? Oh, oh. <laughs> I dropped the ball, sorry. Mine. Okay, can you hear me? Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I just wanna, there you go. Uh, I want to send a big thank you to Jake for organizing this. I'm really thrilled to be invited into this conversation with Catherine Ward and Alec. Uh, and I have to mention this quick. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about Werner Herzog's uh, concept of ecstatic truth. So I'm just really thrilled to be in this theater where he actually gave his Minnesota Declaration and its addendum. That's like really a big dream for me. So thank you. <laughs> Um, so now I'm going to introduce my book, Seance. Um, and it first came out in 2019. And um, it is a book that focuses on the American religion, of American born religion of spiritualism that believes in communication with spirits of the dead. And um, it's in a second edition now, and that's what we have here tonight. And there's actually an exhibition that's based on the book. So it's like the book come to life as an exhibition. And I started Seance in 2001 in Lilydale, New York, the town home to the world's largest spiritualist community. I grew up nearby and I was drawn there after my cousin received a strange um, message from a medium that revealed a family secret that proved to be true. And I thought I'd spend a few weeks there making pictures in this quirky little town, but my project took almost two decades to complete because spiritualism is complicated. In Lilydale, I was immediately faced with the question, how do you photograph invisible things? How do, you, how do you document the supposed exchange between a veiled presence and a visible body? I was also confronted with spiritualism's cultural history and the fact that wherever you find 19th century innovation, you also find spiritualism. We see this shadow history erupting now with the very birth of modern art being reassessed because of the entranced spiritualist painters, women who predate Kandinsky, such as Hilma of Klint. Such facts were missing from every textbook I had ever studied, including my histories of photography. Learning that spiritualism and photography have been connected since their inception was a bombshell, um, and this became a focus. I had never heard the term spirit photography before. Um, the spiritualist in Lilydale told me about it. And I was blown away by these pictures. I was shocked by their absurdity, their outrageousness, their oddness, and their tenderness, and how they spoke about grief and love and loss. But it was the totally bonkers pictures of spiritualist mediums in action that became of most interest to me and in discovering ectoplasm the bodily excretion said to morph into form that really blew my mind. I found photographs of ectoplasm particularly shocking, highly strange, grotesque, oddly beautiful. They were some of the most disturbing photographs I had ever encountered, and I wanted to decode them. So I had to climb into this cultural garbage heap and become a student of this messy, embarrassing history. In my opinion, spiritualism's photographic past is one of the most bizarre, absurd, and uniquely unsettling chapters within the history of photography. And one of the most mind-blowing things was realizing that spiritualism was the first religion to create an iconography using the medium of photography. You could say that spiritualism is to photography as Catholicism is to painting. My work became an attempt to build onto this strange photographic record. Um, so in the book, there are different types of photographs. I was trying to, um, there's like metaphors for Lilydale, spiritualist artifacts. Sorry, one hand. Uh, seance paraphernalia, seance practice. 
and a section that includes the subculture of mediums conducting Victorian-style seances that suggest ancient ritual or visionary art performance. I documented traditions of spiritualist art making, technology, media experiments, and there's my own photographic experiments inspired by these spiritualist techniques. Some pictures use photography's ability to play with time as a primary aspect of paranormal or mediumistic experience is that the laws of time and space seem to morph or become irrelevant. These images consider the conjuring power of photography itself, questioning who or what is the medium. I became excited by crossing the boundary of what is considered bad or wrong technique in documentary photography. Part of the book explores the creepiness of photographs and photography's ability to transform. My book considers how spiritualism and photography both blur the line between life and death through representation and how every photograph is an image of a ghost. The book has three parts. And the first part is a heavily illustrated history of paranormal art and I had some really great contributors that I was super excited about. And I, I love this section. There's just so, so much, I was able to use so much historical uh, imagery. The second part functions like a regular photo book, a long sequence of my images run without text. And the third part is an index where I tell some of my spooky or funny stories and add additional context. Part of that index addresses the surprising fact that spirit photographs have continued in the modern era and that this visionary use of media persists in a variety of ways. Part of my practice has also become an effort to save such history, and so my, ne my next book is an archive of all the seance media that I saved um, related to the American poet, uh, John Nyhart, who wrote the book Black Elk Speaks. He started a group called Sorat. And the second edition of my book has an extra essay and some new pictures that I made during the pandemic of mediums. Um, via Skype and Facebook and um, FaceTime, or Facebook, Face, <laughs> FaceTime, and Zoom. And that's it, thank you. Thank you. Is this thing on? Hi, good evening. Hi, is everybody in the room? Hi, uh, yeah, hi. Um, my name is Wordsworth. Wordsworth and Babazi Musingusi. I'm not from Minneapolis. I'm from the central suburbs of New Jersey. Jersey. <laughs> um, I moved here after graduating from undergrad in 2013 from Rutgers University. I studied cultural anthropology and political science. I thought I was gonna be a lawyer. I thought I was gonna use my passion and fire anger, angst about my lived experience as a first generation queer, soon to be trans masculine um, artist, photographer, visual artist, um, to change the world, do something about it, talk back to it, um, narrate the world the way I saw it, the way I experienced it. Um, but I ended up not going to law school, I faded law school. My parents, um, my dad's a, um, immigrant from Uganda, East Africa. My mom's from Liberia. Um, both uh, New Yorkers moved to New York in the 80s. Um, they were socialites. They liked to gather people around their cultures that they brought across from the Atlantic. Um, and I was totally immersed in their world. Um, I experienced their world through music, um, food, conversation, banter, arguments, in English and in other languages that I did not understand. Um, and I was totally sucked in, but the thing that I really loved that they gifted me was books. Um, literature, photo books, family albums. Um, there was something really special about um, being gifted a book um, and not really fully understanding it until I got old enough to immerse myself into the analog mediums um, and how they took form um, so, um, this, this slide is from my latest, um, publication, it's called A Matter of Time. Um, I, I didn't know what I was going to do with this. Um, it was really just an overview of all the work that had no place to go. 
Um, people my age call them Lucy's. You know, we post them on Instagram. Uh, photo dumps. Everybody familiar with photo dumps? Lots of photo dumps in the zine. Um, <laughs> um, but really, it's it's an overview of the work that I find excitement around from the time I started taking photographs really seriously in 2014 until now, or until 2022 when I first published this. Um, after graduating from undergrad, I moved to New York um, with my father and my sister, um, and just kind of cycling back. Um, my parents, you know, they love to party, gather people, so on and so forth, but you know, there were moments in time where my family's very dysfunctional. And I ended up being raised in a, in a household that was kind of curated by a bad romance. Um, so um, my mother and my father would bicker a lot. They would banter, not in the great ways that I would see over conversations with their friends, their colleagues, their peers, their neighbors. Um, I lost my mother to suicide. Um, it's now 10 years and some change. Um, and she was the one who really gave me a lot of love around uh, being immersed in the world and being your full self in the world and being unapologetic around that. Um, so I would say that, you know, people ask me, so what are you doing here? Well, I'm Minnesota. Uh, I came here for a gap year. <laughs> like law school? Yeah, okay. Um, the gap year, you know, it was, it was charted with burying my mother um, and then flocking into the streets of my camera. Um, so these images were at a time when I was using the camera to really cope with being 22 and not really knowing to process grief healthily. So, you know, I'm from New Jersey. We have a really robust um, underground music scene. I was really immersed in the punk scene, hardcore scene. I would mosh, I would go to shows, not tell my parents where I'm going. I'm going to the mall, I'm going to the movies. I'm going to a firehouse and I'm gonna see some bands and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, hang out with some really big, scary white dudes that are just moshing and throw their bodies across the room. And I found that's a great way to get out angst and, and anger and grief. Um, and then um, when I moved to New York with my father and my sister, I would spend a lot of time with myself. My dad was never in the house, he was out somewhere. My sister would uh, go see my aunts, my, my father's family. My father's family is really based in New York. I was born in Queens. Um, but raised in the suburbs, so I can't say I'm from New York, boo. Um, but I definitely carry that kind of fire. Um, so I would, I, would, I would walk around with my camera all hours of the night, like 11 p.m. to 4 a.m., come back home, do it again, fall asleep. Um, but the thing I really loved about the camera is how it made people really open and, and really like chill and themselves, like this bottom photo, these three um, black, masculine, presumably male friends, lovers, and I don't know if you could see, but you know, this, this person has their knee on top of his, and they're just sharing music. And they just came back from shopping. Um, he's minding his business, he's chilling, he's on his phone, I don't know what he's doing. And then uh, this is the seven. I used to live in um, Long Island City. The seven would take me straight to Times Square. Um, so I can access all of the lines, the A, the E, the orange line, the green line. Um, and I remember just like waiting. It was like really late. I was like, oh my god, I have my camera in my hand. And there's no one around. Um, but on the other side of this um, platform, uh, I also just, I don't know. I love juxtaposition in my photography. Just like, And this is incidental. And this is fleeting, um, where you have this, this houseless person, homeless person, just sitting here on the other side by themselves, isolated. And then you have this couple on the other side in the distance. And I didn't, I didn't notice that until I looked at it. Um, and making the zine, um, where you could see that I made this by hand. That's real tape. You know, These are printed out four by six uh, prints. I sat for six months with a, sketch, a blank sketchbook. I printed out every, every image I was just gawking over and wanted to showcase the Lucy's uh, in my life. 
um, with some curatorial flair um, and just juxtaposed things that had meaning, connection, or they didn't until I sat down with them and really started making this book. Um, so backtrack a little bit. Storytelling is not linear in my world, so bear with me. Um, so um, after being immersed in the music scenes, I also covered local underground hip hop scenes in New York, in Newark. Um, I was also immersed in today's social justice and social movements. Um, so this image was made the summer of 2013. This was the day after George Zimmerman was acquitted. This is from the Million Hoodie March. Started in Harlem, the heart of Harlem. 125th and Adam Clayton Powell. Um, March from there all the way to Union Square. Anybody familiar with that walk? Yeah, long. I took the subway. <laughs> uh, but this is this is in a this is a housing project in Harlem, and you know it was chill. There were no photographers. There was really no leadership. Unfortunately, it was just a lot of people just like walking, flooding the streets, being moved with a spirit of angst and anger, and just wanting to do something. I remember the night before, I was on Twitter in my dorm room. I was living on campus before I graduated. I graduated 2013. This is the summer. And I'm on Twitter and everyone's like, what are we gonna do? What's gonna happen? Are we gonna burn things down? Are we gonna storm the, not storm the Capitol. Um, <laughs> cringe. Um, <laughs> hope I'm not offending anybody out there. Um, but yeah, someone's, and I, I saw a flyer posted by the, the US Communist Party and they're gonna host a rally in Harlem and told people to come out and flood the streets and take the streets over. And I'm like, hell yeah, this is my dream. I'm 22 years old and I have my camera. I, I bought my digital camera when I, was, when I was 17, 16. I started on analog. My dad gave me his old film camera, Yashica FX Super. I would take pictures of flowers and other things that I had access to in the suburbs. And then I got a digital camera and it kind of changed my orientation to the medium. So I took that camera, it was a Canon Rebel XT with a kit lens, very limiting. Um, took that, took a train to, to New York and um, just followed the crowd. And this scene is probably the most like explicit memory with or without an image. Like I will never forget how this, this happened. And you know, we're walking and Cops are walking along us, and it was kind of like an intimidation tactic, low key. Um, this guy comes off the sidewalk, and this cop kind of shoves him on, back on, and he's like, no. And they're kind of getting to an argument, and you have this guy kind of holding him back. You got this person kind of jumping into the mix. This person is just kind of like yelling at him. There's like a whole flood of people back here. But this is the first time I saw a display of people power, and like regular people, regular people talking back to the state. This is five years later? No, this is three years later. This is the summer of 2016. This was a rally at Rikers Island, um, a march for um, Khalif Browder, who committed suicide in jail, being locked up for stealing a backpack and you know suffered, suffered from his death. Um, and this was more organized. They had community leaders from the area. This is in Queens, Rikers Island is in Queens. And um, they were delivering a letter to the warden to talk about the conditions about housing um, young people without a trial. And what really stuck out for me and, and someone who had a, a camera in their hand looking like me, moving like me, um, I have no press pass. You have the press kind of just focused in on this and not the full, full scene. And that kind of shaped my documentary portrait practice as a photographer. Um, and I was just really eager to share things with people. I would post these on Instagram, um, a blog, my website, um, and then later photo books. Um, this is from the publication that's outside right now, the letter form known as Q, Voices from Minnesota's Queer Immigrant Community. Um, it is a intergenerate, it's an oral history project on the intergenerational narratives of queer immigrants um, and their migrant stories making home away from home. This is Key Alexander. They are a um, 
trans, non-binary, um, Afro Puerto Rican, um, from Buffalo, New York. Um, I met them years ago um, through the local organizing scene here. Um, they were doing a PhD program at the U, um, doing some really, really dope stuff, and connected with them intellectually, and they really gave me a perspective on what transness meant through an immigrant perspective. And um, this, this book um, was, um, at least the theme of it, really came after the first iteration. The first iteration, I did it by myself. I messed up, I screwed up um, real bad. I blew a lot of money making the first one. The second one, this was funded through the Minnesota State Arts Board um, and had a lot of support from my community um, collaborators. Um, I ended up publishing a book from these candid conversations with five, um, five folks based here from all across the world making Twin Cities their home and talking about queerness outside the bounds of a, a sexual and an aesthetic identity. Um, really talking about queerness as a political, social, cultural identity um, and taking the kind of the ethos of queerness to not just talk about what it means to present or be in a body, but it, how it means to think and feel and be queer. Um, and me and Key had a very long conversation. I had to cut this so much, it hurt my heart. Um, he is a really dear friend. Um, but what I really loved about this publication is that uh, the conversations dominated, not the images. With Instead of my other books, they were photo dom dominated. Um, this is another chapter, Igor Ray, um, trans, mask, um, Indian American poet, artist, badass, love them so much. Um, and. They're also a dear friend, and the, the book really, like, I had to find people that I can be comfortable talking about these topics, or very heavy topics. What drove you from home? You just heard how I was driven from home. Um, and how do you make home? And um, yeah, these candid conversations really transformed my approach to bookmaking, photographing, portraits, that sort of thing. Time check? Yeah. I'm good? Hasn't been five minutes yet? Are you kidding? Okay, really? Okay, well, I'm gonna bump through this. Anyway, see, yapper. Um, okay, well, so this is the this is my process for the for the zine, and you know, this is in my kitchen table. That's a baby photo of me in Cape Cod with on a phone talking to nobody, with a pink dress on, and then this is me um, documenting my first show in uh, Lower East Side in New York. Um, and really chartering all the work that I just talked about. Um, yeah, lots of decision making, lots of images I didn't put in, lots of tape I didn't use. Um, water bottle I lost a couple months ago. Um, but yeah, like the analog medium, you know, it's like really special to me. Um, again, the book feels like a special gift. You can't take artwork from a gallery, you can't uh, there's so many ways to access art, photography, the book is really something that is accessible to all people of all classes and backgrounds, access to art, that sort of thing. Um, and I'm excited to talk more in conversation. Thank you so much for not cutting me off, Alex. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the, I love the energy when you're talking words with about um, that the making of the work in the earliest days, the like going out at night, being out. And at that stage, you're making work for yourself, presumably. Um, and that's probably true of, of all of us, I'm not sure. But there, there comes a moment where you want to share the work, and the book is a, a shared form. And maybe it starts with the photo album, which is like shared with the family, and then something moving out. So Catherine, uh, I'm curious about this, the thinking about audience. To what extent were you th imagining them? Who are they? Or, or were you not thinking about it and a publisher approaches you and then suddenly you are? Yeah, I, um, I, yeah. Imagining audience. Um, because of the war, I got contact. So I had, I had some recognition of this work in the early 2000s. 
had a, a gallery, was able to show it. And then, you know, the New York gallery scene is a hungry monster, maybe not interested in the work, and my work is going into another direction. So I it sort of went under the bed, right? This whole body of work went under the bed. And then because of the war, Stanley Barker saw a post. I was you know, furious and uh, mad and posting these old photographs. Um, and they said, we would like to see, you know, do you have a, a website? I'm like, no, um, <laughs> we'd like to see more of this work. And that's how they, so I wasn't thinking about the audience, but I thought it was a good time. Um, at first I was, uh, you know, do I, do I make a book? Is it a, it, you know, t to me, books are a celebration, and I was, there was nothing to celebrate. But I uh, eventually, in my mind, I rationalized that the world needs to see these pictures. So. And it, did you think about uh, an American audience, a European audience, a Ukrainian? Um, everybody, everybody. Everybody. Yeah. And Shannon, I'm curious in your case because this, like your approach to the the book is so like yours is a double album with li with liner notes. It's it's big. It's ten ten albums. It is. Uh, no, and, and it's and it seems like it's a big part of the audience is this community. Is that the case? Yeah, I, I made the book for um, multiple audiences, and um, part of what I mean, there's like a real uh, attraction repulsion response to the subject matter, and so early on, yeah, a lot of people in some people in photography were not interested in it at all. So I started to find other audiences. That, so not just the paranormal audience, but there was a lot of like history of medicine people or um, art historians. Like I started to talk to those audiences other than the fo just the photo audience, and then I wanted to make a book for all of those audiences. Like I wanted it, I wanted it to serve the community, and also it it does serve the community because like nobody was paying attention. Like I was, I was literally the only person still documenting this stuff. I didn't have stiff competition in the seance <laughs> room. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I made the book for for multiple audiences, but also. I made the book because I had to become a researcher and a writer because every time I would show my picture, I'd have to do this dog and pony mm -hmm. show dance about this history and um, explain before I even got to my pictures. So that's how I had to do the book. And and was the publisher on board with that in terms of the, the marketing of the book and distribution that it was going out to these different audiences? Well, my so my first publisher, he was very interested in it just being um, like uh, pictures that are quote unquote occult, even though spiritualists don't consider themselves occultists. So he was very interested in those strange art history angle. Um, but uh, my newest publisher, um, they don't do any books like this. It's more of like a neutral zone, meaning they they're into cultural history and photography, but it's not it's not that slant. So. Um, yeah, it, it's it's been weird how it's served different audiences. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to use this music analogy again, where's with I, like, I thought like I thought in a way, and maybe it's part th partly the music background, but especially your first zine functions uh, almost like cassettes that people pass around. You know, it has that energy. Um, and I'm wondering, yeah, same question. Who's the audience? Is it strictly, you know, for your friends and community, or is it vast? Um, one, I really love the analogy around cassettes. That's really cool. <laughs> um, very affirming in very particular ways. Um, yeah, I would say that the photo book to me is like a giftable format for in photography. Um, I would say it's anybody that likes books, whether they like photography or not. Um, can I read something? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, the photo book was where I could tip the scales of power and how I could share, present, and build worlds for others to better understand me and my point of view. 
It's a place I could challenge convention, style, layout, even the kind of images I published, personal, on assignment, bored, um, bold, etc. What could and was allowed or even desired to publish? Publishing, publishing is still very much a cis white male centered world. Self-publishing was the only way I could showcase my work professionally without relying on the approval or affirmations of galleries, museums, institutions to curate and mount my work. I didn't want to wait on those approvals, otherwise I might have never, I, I might have been arrested in time. Does that answer the question? It does, it yeah. does indeed. Right, cool, yeah. It does indeed. What, what's interesting though is that is, as uh, self-motivated as, as that is, it's still very collaborative, at least in, in your second publication. I mean, you had an external designer and then there's all the interviews. Yeah, yeah, that was a really big project. Like, one, I started it before the pandemic. I got um, 2019 Artist Initiative Grant through MSAB, Minnesota State Arts Board. I was really excited. Uh, the first book would looked like literally like a tabloid. It was just really not professionally like, clean. It was inexpensive to make, but it was very inexpensive in material and I really wanted to elevate my practice and really present my work with some flair. Um, so with this grant, gave me enough resources to do that. Um, and I knew I didn't want to do it alone. All of my other publications, I've made 11 publications. This last one, these last two were probably the most professionally looking um, in presentation and style and feel. Um, but the letter formerly known as Q, um, the second iteration, um, it was also picked up by a local publisher, which gave me an editor which gave me an access to a printer. It helps, the, the matte finish, did you feel the cover on that thing? <laughs> if you haven't, it's really, you know, and um, <laughs> um, I took my time with it. I wasn't working at a speed of light. I wasn't thinking about Instagram followers and buyers and bookshops. I was thinking about the process and the, something that I'd never really thought about as a, as a bookmaker. And, so Wising Publishing was the publisher that helped me publish that book. Um, MCAD was the one who allowed me to go into their studios and photograph my muses um, in their studio spaces because I didn't have a studio at that time. Um, and I had this idea of, you know, what are you like, you know, in your presentation in private and then in public? So I photographed people in black box studios in MCAD and then I photographed them in their homes, in their neighborhoods and juxtaposing their presentation, their, ex their expressions, and you can kind of see how comfortable and how chill they are at home, in their streets, in, their, in the studio. It looks like a headshot, it's like not really fun looking, it's not colorful like the environments that they brought me into. Um, and then um, with the book, in addition to the book, I did an installation project with Public Functionary um, and curated a show with them um, in the third floor, third floor gallery in Northrop King Building in 2021. So from 2019, I'm doing all these interviews. I finished them. The last one is January 2020. And I think I'm gonna do a show in MCAD in March. Imagine that, yeah? Yeah. I get a call from the gallery director. They're like, no, no mamas, you're not doing a show. You're gonna have to push that back. And I was really heartbroken, but it gave me time to really uh, really put some effort into the presentation. So I, that year, over the summer, woo, was anybody here for the summer? Anyway, um, <laughs> summer 2020, that was a lot. But then 2021, spent a lot of time um, you know, working on this final publisher. They put me to work, they put me on a timeline. Um, and I was able to write the introduction. Um, I don't know if you noticed the date on the introduction. It was January 6th. I literally wrote it that afternoon in a notebook, and I went on Twitter and I said, oh my god, this is who I'm doing this for. I'm doing this for history. It's a history, baby. Um, but yeah, it was very collaborative from the book to the presentation, the book and the installation, and showcasing it particularly to my community, LGBTQ, queer, trans, immigrants of color, um, first generation immigrants, my, I'm not a migrant, I was born in the States, I have a particular understanding and relationship to my culture. Um, 
these people in the book have different kinds and levels of connection to their homes and their culture. Some of them moved when they were 10. Some of them move when they're 18. Some of them are in their 50s now, you know, and they have a very wide, expansive understanding of, of queerness. And so even the, the muses were a part of that project. And I have, I have a practice where I, you know, I, they're co-creators. You know, I'm not making work by myself. Anything I'm making, there's somebody else making that with me. Um, I cannot take credit for the brilliant things that I make without crediting communities that allow me to tell their stories. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna we're gonna open it to questions soon, but uh, I know that there are a number of people that want to make books out here and probably want to ask some of these questions that might seem crass, especially compared to all the things we're talking about, subject matter wise and community wise, but. Uh, so I want to talk about like the economics of photo books for a second. Oh no! <laughs> uh, yeah. And. Oh, wow. Yeah, w no, because it, maybe it's taboo or something. But it, like, I think it's interesting in terms of how many copies are printed, uh, and does it does it cost you money? Do you make money? That kind of thing. And you don't have to obviously like pull out your tax forms or anything, but. <laughs> I'm just, uh, yeah. Uh, um, I hesitated to make the book because it cost a lot of money to make. And um, the artists typically are investing in the books that they're making. Um, I even, you know, my husband said, oh, well, I'll sell some, al some vinyl and raise some <laughs> money. For, and he did. He raised half of the, the uh, book cost. You, I, it's a labor of love. It's, it's not a labor of... Um, economics and you're not making any money and I think it's worth it but you you know you have to know that it's not money that mm. you're making it for and I'll, but also so your book is sold out is that true it is it, it yeah. is <laughs> except here at the walker oh <laughs> yes apparently in England they're being sold for 250 we'll see then so. you can fund your next book with that <laughs> Jenny, you want to take a crack at it? How much money are you making? <laughs> um, so the f the first edition, um, I did in invest some money in the design because I the, the publisher and I weren't seeing eye to eye on the design. So you found the designer yourself? I found that I hired the designer. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I had to I had to invest in that. But he paid for the publication, and then he did a special edition. I got paid in a lot of books. It, it went out of print. So um, and then this new one, I got an advance, and I didn't have to pay. And I, there's another edition coming. An advance. Wow, that's great. I know. I don't know. <laughs> I but maybe I. But I. That's all I've received, <laughs> and it's <laughs> I don't know I I've 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 gotten copies of books too. You usually get paid in books, right? Yeah, like it's true. It, you, that's yes, you're so you're able to sell some books. Um, and, yeah. So so yeah, that's what's um. But I think this this one is almost out. So there'll be another one, but it's not going to be for a little while. And that I mean, those books do help with the gifting element of it because photo books can be expensive. And so it is a way to share your work by just handing some out too, right? Like, like the zine format. I'll keep this brief. I'm sorry. I am just a talker. Um, yeah, let's talk about it economically. Mm -mm, it's not a money maker. It's a ball breaker. Like I lost. I feel like I've lost so much money. Like I'm gambling. And it's like you're gambling on yourself, you're investing in yourself. It's like a way to bypass waiting to get a solo show or waiting to be included in a group exhibition. You're just doing it. It's self-initiated. I This Letter from Landon's Q is the only book that had a publisher behind it. And the other ones took forever to make and it was stressful. It's taxing on your body, it's taxing on the mind, and it's taxing on your pockets. And I'm taking money from residencies, from gigs, from grants, and it's just not enough. And then the sales don't really match. You know, it's just, it. 
I I haven't profited from a book yet, you know, um, and I'm several in. I would love an advance. That'd be nice. <laughs> must be nice. Must be two hundred fifty dollars. Must be nice. Must be nice, right? And um, and then my <laughs> and my you know the the this publisher partnered with Itasca Books, and they're like a huge you know distribution company based here. And the publisher wanted me to print 800 copies. I'm like, girl, I don't know 800 people that want this. I can try. Who is this for? Everybody, I guess, at that point. But, um, you know, I've, I've sold a, a, a nice chunk of it. I still have plenty left. Go get one when you can. Um, <laughs> sell me out. My Zena sold out. There's only six in, in existence, and they're all here at the Walker. Um, woo, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love that spirit. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just, it's a, uh, it's definitely like a crash course in like art business where you really have to like be measured and really calculate around, you know, how many copies, how, you know, what, what am I going to put in? What do I want out? You know, at points I'm just like, I just want to see my work off of the screen. I just want to be able to gift this to someone and not share a link with somebody, right? Like I want to like really create something personal for somebody. Um, so it's like mathematics of the heart and the mind. Wow. <laughs> Mic drop. Yeah, good. Maybe let's, uh, let's open it up to questions. Are there any out there? Oh, there's a whole bunch. I don't know how we do this. How big are each of your... How, how, the question is... How, how, how big are your editions of books, each of you? I mean, we know 800 for you. That's, it's really a helpful number to kind of sure. get a perspective yeah. on yeah. this market question, which is yeah. interesting to people, I think, it is. Mm -hmm. especially since you guys have to invest so much in it. So mm -hmm. I'm curious, if you sold out, were you selling out 200? Were you selling out 2,000? Uh, I think it was about 950, something like that. Um, and maybe this is too personal, but how many copies did you get for yourself? Do you know? I don't remember. Um, it wasn't half for sure. I think I got 40 or 50 okay. copies. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my first edition was 1,500, and this new edition is 3,000. Woo! Wow. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> the wrong idea. <laughs> uh, there's a question here. Oh, there's a, if you don't mind just waiting for the microphone. Are you allowed to answer the same question that you asked them about the economics of your books? <laughs> Are they asking you a question? You're not on the panel. I mean, what what I can say, which is interesting, is that my first publisher really liked the idea of selling out books. And so it would be a small number, and they'd be sold out, and thus they're valuable. Um, and my yeah. current publisher does not believe in that, believes in making them readily available, which I was skeptical of because the whole art world is is based on this uh, fake demand that's... and. Um, and in f you know, in fact, uh, it, it is possible, but it's sorry. But then it's all about distribution. So, in order for the economics of the thing to work, it has to be distributed everywhere, and that's not easy because they're they're heavy pieces of paper that get shipped all over the world, and so it's very tricky. But uh, yeah, that's. That was a little loose on the answer, wasn't it? <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. Uh, I seem to be biasing this side, but sure, a fella up there. Um, this question's for Nance. For instance, when you're taking photos on the train like that, do you ask for permission or forgiveness? Do you Take the picture mm -hmm. and I'm gonna ask for forgiveness. You just dead name me. My name is Wordsworth or Word. I'm so sorry. Oh yeah, I don't I'm go sorry. by Nance anymore. I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Not I'm to put you on the spot, but I need I everybody apologize. to know that please do not call me Nance. Um, I'm sorry. I, no, it's okay. 
So forgive me. Give me permission to forgive you. Yeah. Um, permission. Um, this is more of a photography question than a book question. But um, yeah, I think there's like a heat check, if you will. You know, um, a lot of the times when I'm just wandering around in a place I don't know, I probably won't have my camera out and I'll just be interacting with people so they know I'm not like a paparazzi or a, bl a blogger or something like that. Like I'm just, I'm just, a, I'm just a human being in an area um, going from one place to another. Um, this photo actually at the bottom was taken with my phone and I did not ask them, but they saw me take it afterwards. And um, the person sitting over here smiled up at me afterwards, just kind of like, mm, thanks, but no thanks. Um, these people were totally unaware. I mean, this guy was Kagan. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then maybe even just like going to something else like this, like there is no, there's no like, hey, don't take this. It's like, you have to take this. Like there was no other, at the time, like I know that we were all familiar with like protests in cities and demonstrations and people being in the streets and it's not just press with cameras and recorders. It's everybody, everybody, everybody has a camera now. At this point in time, nobody really had a camera and I stuck out like a sore thumb. So I had to act like I was with the New York Times or Wall Street Journal and like, I left my lanyard in the car, you know, like, <laughs> you know, and um, I was just very pressed about these moments being fleeting and not being documented. Um, and if they are, they're from particular perspectives. It's, it, it's right in their face, it's cropped, and it's sensationalized. Whereas I like wide scale scenes where you're getting not just people, but environment, and it creates a different kind of context. Um, so to answer your question, I did not ask for permission. I just did this. And yeah. do you ever get like a hand in your face or people that wanna smash your camera? Oh, ba I've been threatened. Like that? I've been threatened, run out. I've been called out of my name. I have feared for my life. I have thought that this would be the last time I'd be breathing with a camera around my my neck, mm -hmm. because I am, you see the you see who I am and I am perceived, and this is before I started transitioning. I was perceived as a, a cis queer black girl, not even a young black woman. Um, yeah, so there's yeah there's some math around that. Okay. Thank that you. Answer. Yeah. This question here in the middle. Whoever gets to it first. <laughs> uh, this is a harder question, and it might not have an answer, but especially with a book, when are you done? <laughs> like, when is it? You're on, Shannon, you're on your third edition, so I'm thinking, like, when does it feel like something you're ready to give away? Well, I, I, I guess it, for me, <laughs> I'm actually working on a sequel <laughs> because I'm, I, I see that my next book as um, I'm working on a trilogy. So I guess, um, so my next book is this archival thing that I'm actually um, interpreting and doing a lot of writing. So I'm not, I'm being, um, I'm having a different role as, a, as an artist in that book. And then the, the third book is the, the trilogy. I already started it. And um, so I guess I'm not done. I mean, you would think after 20 years you'd be done. I mean, <laughs> but I'm, I'm still. I, I have to tie it together with that third book. So, but for for this book, I knew it was. Um, I knew I was done because I. There's this uh, phenomena in spiritualism called materialization, and I finally got to photograph one of those seances, and so I felt like I had hit, hit like an apex or I had hit a point where now I could, I finally got to, like, cause the whole book is kind of me chasing ectoplasm. Like, are there people actually doing this in the world? Like, could I find them? Like, that's kind of like the quest of the book. And I actually did get to, um, I got all around that topic. So then I felt done, but that took me 18 years. So <laughs> I don't know, I work on things for a long time. Uh, so do I, uh, in the nature of a great Slavic epic novel that <laughs> continues. 
Um, and there aren't sequels or anything. It's just one <laughs> big tomb. <laughs> so it's I, the question is, it's a really good one. It's really hard to know when you're done. And you're just always like, what if, or I could have, or, yeah. You'll know, though. You will know. Do you? OK, you can tell me later. Oh, that's going to say I just run out of money. <laughs> <laughs> It's also hard to know when you're done with a panel discussion, but uh, I think there's one no, no, question, we, right? Wait. Yeah. Yeah. Which I one? You, yeah. you you call on it. You I've I've got a mic here. Um, <laughs> All right, you can just holler. Theater kid one. So I was wondering um, when you saw the oh sorry, I don't know either. I don't know. Okay. You got the mic. Oh, go go yeah. for it. When you saw the first proof of your like artwork printed out for the first time, like how many rounds of revisions and stuff did you have to go to get an accurate representation of like your initial intention of like the exposure and color and everything with the choosing the paper style and everything like that? Was it directed to one of us or all of us? Yeah. Um, I went to Italy and worked with an incredible printer and it took about three days to, and that was lucky. Um, and it's, it's just being able to work with somebody who could understand what the pictures look like or what they should be like. You can give them a file, but then there are a bunch of people interpreting that file, right? So I know other people, like right behind you, who've worked longer on a book um, to get it right. <laughs> Um, so for, for my book, I, I actually had a lot of wacky color going on. And so I sat with, I did the CMYK versions with um, like a woman who was like a magician. who I reinterpreted like every single picture with her. I sat for weekends. And then they, we did proofs. And then I didn't, I didn't go to, my first book was printed in Italy. The second one was in Denmark. Um, I didn't go to either, but we did proofs back and forth with Ruth, who was amazing. Like she, it's like a total art. Like she totally, we just reinterpreted literally every image. Yeah, it's hard. Um, my did mine over Zoom because it was during the pandemic. It was here, and it took like three months. I like went back and forth with the designer, and. I didn't know what I wanted because I've never made a book this nice before. Like again, touch the cover, it is insanely <laughs> nice. Um, but yeah, I think that's another part of like the question around collaboration. Like, what do you think? Like, you know more than me, you know, like talking to a publisher and their experiences in like creating and presenting books with quality. You know, I'm from the underground scene and like if it has a cover, great, you know, whatever. Uh, the pages aren't falling out with a staple, great. Um, but you know, I I was slowed down by my my editor and my publisher. I was like, what do you want your book to look like? What are the elements that you want to pull out? You know, like even from the colors of the chapters, like I pulled those colors from people's like shirts, back like back environments, like the text, the 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 justification, the everything. You know, like there's so many decisions to be made that it slows you down and really puts you in a toilet, it really locks into a process instead of like producing something. Like the book is going to be a book, but how are you getting there? And that really taught, that process really taught me like, well, how long is it gonna take? It's like the speed of decision making. There was the question that was missed. I don't know who it was though. I'm interested in the incorporation of language into all three projects um, in different ways for each one. Catherine, you have bilingual language. Uh, Shannon, you have the language of many other commentators that are contributing to your book. And Word, you have like your handwritten language in the slides that you showed us and then also the interviews that you did. So I'm wondering in each process like how you reached upon the idea of bringing language into this visual medium and whether how you felt it necessary. 
Were any of you anxious to include your own writing as well? Mortified. <laughs> Have you seen my handwriting? It's, it's <laughs> sorry. It's mortifying. It's like so scary. Um, I think that's a really good question. I mentioned that the uh, publisher um, usually publishes just photographs and not text. Um, I think that the it was a hard decision for me to make, but I also I wanted to employ somebody who is working in Ukraine, and I wanted to pay her. She actually donated it to um, writers who were on the front in, during, in the war. She refused to take it. Um, so it was, it was a little bit about that, but I also think the visual Cyrillic alphabet and the, and the English together sort of talks about this place in between where I, I sit. Um, so I thought that that was important. Well, for me, so I, I do have the essays, but I also wrote like 30,000 words for this book, and I did not want to. The first. 30,000? Yeah, I did like an index, so every oh single picture has like a story behind it. Yeah. But the my first publisher um, demanded that he said, I want to know, no, we're going to want to know for history. And, and um, so I, I did do it, and I hated it, and I was, I was, str I mean, it was really, really hard, but I worked with an editor. And now I very much have writing as part of my process. And the next book I wrote my first, like I wrote like a novella. That of, I, I wrote a history of the group, so I, I actually wrote the history myself. And I worked with an editor. And I had never worked with an editor before, and it's kind of magical. It's a really, it's a really interesting, amazing relationship if you find the right editor. And I, I have one editor that I work with. So, so I kind of became a writer through having to do this book. Um, and it was also very cool to um, have other people write for your book and like have the exchange of um, what it should be or what they're going to say. I mean, that whole process was was really cool. And um, yeah, that was a really big part of it. Um, yeah, I I just wanted my zine to look like a zine, so I hand wrote it. Like that's like that street culture. That's like graffiti. I wanted it to feel like a human made it. You know, I didn't want it to look clean. I wanted it to look like something that was an I, AI generated. We're living in a world where everything is symmetrical and all of that. I just wanted it to look like hands were put on it. Um, and then even the introduction, like getting vulnerable and talking about my personal life, like that was terrifying. But I felt it was necessary to really crack people, like crack myself open for people to really see who I am because they'll look at my work and you're just, you're so, you know, everything is so symmetrical and clean and all of these things. It's like, well, actually, this is the human behind it. So that was like human. I wanted to center my humanness inside of that. Uh, the letter falling down as Q, the interviews were candid. They were recorded. And I didn't, I fought with my editor to not take out the ums, hmms, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, a lot of people's like different ways of expressing themselves because I thought that was very important to the, the chapters of people's stories of how they became who they were. Um, yeah, and then the introduction, I thought it was really important to know when it was written, and, you know, it was at a time where, you know, thinking about a lot of things, and, um, I also, you know, anthropology, I'm just constantly writing, writing, reading, studying, researching, um, so I wanted to kind of bring in something that, um, you cannot see through photographs alone. All right, I want to leave time for you all to see and buy these books, so... Thank you so much for everyone. Thank you for the great questions.